usually my favorite way to start the day is just with an amazing time of worship and worshiping together. And the fellowship technology staff, these guys are amazing, aren't they? And just creating such a great experience, kind of just pouring back into you guys as ministry leaders. Um, I work in full-time ministry, and so I know what the days are like sometimes, and you don't often get a chance to just absorb and take in. And so I hope you guys are having an amazing time uh, here this, this uh, I guess, couple of days uh, with these guys. So um, I love the fellowship technology team. They're just such an encouragement and support. So I hope that you guys are sensing that for sure this next couple days. Well, my name is Jenny Katrin, and uh, I'm from uh, Cross Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee is where I serve. I serve as executive director, and that's really, really troublesome to actually describe. But uh, probably anything and everything that needs to get done at some point, I've touched it in one way or another. The worst day for us was when I tried to run our children's ministry when we were in between children's pastors. We both said, senior pastor and I said, no, don't ever let her do that again. Um, so so I, don't, uh, I don't lead in children's ministry, but I do do a lot of stuff um, to help support our team and just help move ministry forward. And I think we kind of all share that passion of taking what God's gifted us and stewarded us with, with as church leaders and helping accomplish the Great Commission and just seeing Christ's name made famous. And so um, I think we probably all share that common goal. How many of you intended to be in ministry full-time when you were like a kid? You said, I'm going to be a pastor, or I'm going to work on church staff, or I'm going to do ministry full-time. Anybody? Like knew that really early on? Just a few of you. I didn't either. In fact, when I was a kid, I had a lot of things that I thought I wanted to be, and not any of them were a pastor or church ministry leader in some capacity. The first thing I remember wanting to be as a kid was, uh, would take me back to the first time, one of the first times my parents took me to see Santa Claus. Now, some of you may not be cool with that idea. My parents weren't Christians at the time, so you can kind of give them some grace on that. But we went to see Santa Claus, and I was about three or four years old, and I had on the big, like, big, big Christmas dress, like the thing that was wider than I was tall. I think it was seafoam green, and, or at least the 1970s pictures are now seafoam green because they're aged. But uh, I had that big fluffy Christmas dress on. It had all the layers of tulle underneath it. And I was all dressed up in my, my beautiful Christmas dress. And we get up to see Santa, and I sit on Santa's knee. And he says, well, what would you like for Christmas? And I said, I'd like a chainsaw like my dad. And Santa kind of looked at my parents like, is this kid for real? Like she, you know, I mean, mom had the bow and the curly hair and the whole nine yards. And I said, I want a chainsaw like my dad because I wanted to be like my dad. That was the first thing when I was a little girl, I wanted to be like my dad. I loved my dad. I was a tomboy, and, but I was like a schizophrenic tomboy because I wanted to wear the big fluffy dresses because I actually enjoyed that. Mom didn't have to force me into those, like some of you probably have to force your kids into nice clothes. So she didn't have to force me into that. I loved that. What she had to do was force me out of the dress when I wanted to go play out, outside with my Tonka trucks in the dirt in my fluffy, pretty dress. And so uh, Santa kind of looked and was like, is this kid for real? And my parents kind of nodded. And I think they kind of anticipated that, a that answer from me. And I did get the chainsaw, by the way, for Christmas. Um, I still remember it, but it, was, it, it, it didn't quite meet my expectations because it had these little beads that kind of ran around the track. So it didn't really do any work. So, um, so I stayed out there cutting logs with my dad, but it didn't work out so well. The next thing I wanted to be um, was based off of a TV show from the late 1970s. Do any of you remember the Carol Burnett show? Yes, I loved Carol Burnett. And uh, the Carol Burnett show was my favorite show as a kid. The reality is I don't really know if I knew what, uh, anything that was happening in the Carol Burnett show. Like none of the humor, it was all over my head. But I remember Carol would come out at the, at the beginning of the show, if you remember, it was a variety show, and Carol would come out at the beginning of the show and she'd be in some elegant, extravagant dress. Again, my, my schizophrenic tomboy loved the, like, really elegant dress. And she would either sing a song or she'd do some opening skit or something. And I just remember loving, like, the, her presence. That this was a strong, confident woman who uh, was very entertaining, could capture an audience. And so I wanted to be Carol Burnett. That was the next thing I claimed that I wanted to be as a kid. So I would grab, you know, I think Friday nights was when I would watch that show. And I would grab anything that resembled a microphone, could be a water bottle, except we didn't do water bottles back then, grab anything that resembled a microphone and just pretend to be Carol Burnett, mimic her until the show was over and I had to go to bed. The Carol Burnett thing didn't work out so good either. And then uh, in junior high, I discovered that uh, there was this thing called the music business. 
And, and in Nashville, Tennessee, I actually was raised in northern Wisconsin, so I'm really not even sure how I knew Tennessee existed or the music business in Tennessee. But I um, decided that I really wanted to work at a record company. That was my aspira aspiration. That's what I wanted to do when I graduated high school and I went off to college. I wanted to pursue a, a career in the music business. And that one kind of worked out for me. I uh, graduated, um, or graduated high school, went off to college, by the age of 20 had landed my first job at a record label in Nashville. And it was my dream job. It was exactly the company I wanted to work for. It was exactly who I said I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And so for nine years, I did that. I climbed the corporate ladder while my friends were um, getting married, having kids, and uh, learning to potty train. I was uh, going to conferences, devouring leadership books, and trying to take golf lessons, all to uh, make it in the corporate world as a corporate executive. And for a good season of time, God really honored and allowed me to live that dream. And then as God does sometimes, he throws you a curveball. And I found myself in this place where I was doing exactly what I had always dreamed, or at least for the last decade, had always dreamed I wanted to do. And I was really restless, and I was un like unsettled, and I knew that I wasn't necessarily doing what God had called me to do. And so I just began to pray through that. I began to t talk to mentors and reach out to people in my life who had know knew me well and could speak into it. And, and I would just pray, God, what are you asking from me? Here I am. I'm in my late 20s. I'm a step away from an executive position at a record label. This is always what I wanted to do. And in fact, I was working for a Christian record label, if that counts. So I was doing ministry in a corporate sense. And, uh, and yet I was restless, and I knew I wasn't where God had me. And so I went through this season of just wrestling through, God, what are you asking of me? Where are you asking me to go? And eventually I came on staff at Cross Point Church as executive director. My husband and I had helped launch the church, and so we had been volunteers. We'd been pouring ourselves into it from a volunteer capacity, and I thought that was good. I thought that was a perfect fit for us. And our senior pastor, Pete Wilson, is the lead pastor at Cross Point Church, and he would tap me on the shoulder occasionally and say, Jenny, if you ever leave the music business, I want you to talk to me. I would say, Pete, you're crazy. Like, I'm going to be a record label exec. I'm going to rule the world in the music business. I'm not working at a church. What's a church going to do with me? And, uh, and so, but God began to just work on my heart and kind of break my heart and help me recognize that he had a plan that was a little bit different than some of my dreams had been. And uh, through a series of conversations and just an amazing time of God really helping me unpack who I was and who I was in Him, I moved into ministry full time and that's where I serve today. And it's been just a remarkable journey. But one of the things I've learned along the way, and this is the thing I want to share with you all today, is that as, for as much as we feel like we're in the place that God has placed us, we're not always necessarily completely secure or confident in that calling. You ever had those days? where you know that ministry, you should love ministry, you should love everything about ministry, you should be like, you know, jumping up and down and raising your arms in worship and knowing that you're serving the greatest cause for the kingdom that you could possibly do, and yet some days you just get bogged down by the stuff, the, the emails, the calls, the database entry, the, you know, all of these things that are part of making ministry happen, but sometimes we get bogged down by that and we forget the calling and sometimes lose our confidence in that calling. And so today I want to share with you some of my journey, and I want to share with you um, a story from uh, Scripture, uh, from the story of Deborah. Uh, I, I don't know if I ever learned about Deborah when I was in Sunday school. I don't know that that story ever came up. And so it's just been in recent years that I've kind of uncovered Deborah's story in Scripture. And it's become such a rich like, treasure to me in seeing a woman who is extraordinarily confident in what God was asking her to do. So we're going to unpack this story and talk about it a little bit, and I hope you guys will find just some sense of encouragement in the confidence in being called to where God has placed you and stepping into that. And so here's what we're going to unpack that. We're picking up the story of Deborah uh, in Judges 4 and 5. There's only two chapters dedicated to Deborah's story. And so uh, our Old Testament writers sometimes weren't very descriptive in their, in their writing. They gave you the facts, and sometimes they didn't leave, they left out some of the embellishment that as a, as a girl, you kind of like all the juicy details behind the scenes, but we're going we're gonna to interpret those ourselves. Uh, so we pick up the story in Judges 4 and 5. 
And uh, at this time, Deborah is a judge of Israel. She's actually a prophet, priest, and judge of Israel at this time. Um, the Israelites have been under torment from the Canaanites for years. And so they've been under, God's people have been under serious oppression. And uh, in fact, some scholars and commentaries say that the Canaanites had completely stripped the Israelites of any weapons um, or and, and any defense. And so they were really defenseless and frustrated and just probably in a really kind of dark season as, as God's people. And so we pick the story up there, and uh, Deborah is their leader at this point in time. We pick it up in Judges 4, uh, verse 4. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. Some things don't change over time. Like, they don't give us all these details behind Deborah's story, but um, if you notice, it says that Deborah, she held court under the palm of Deborah. Other interpretations say she held court under a palm tree. So I know this is a girl after my own heart because she, like, sets up camp. Like, she creates the best office environment that she could possibly have given her day and her age. So um, she sets up court under a palm tree, and the Israelites come to her to have their disputes decided. Isn't that what we do, ladies? Like, we decide and settle disputes all day long. Whether you're a wife or you work in an office or whatever ministry context, we settle disputes all day long. So that's what Deborah's doing. Verse 6. She sent for Barak, son of Abinam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. And here's where we start to see some of Deborah's confidence um, behind the story. And, and what you see is a confidence in her relationship with Christ be, or with God, because she confidently says to Barak, who is the commander of the Israelite army, "The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you: Go take with you ten thousand men. We're going to take on the Canaanites." Now, if you're Barak, you got to be thinking this girl's crazy. Because we've been under oppression, we have no weapons, I'm not even sure we can convince 10,000 men to come with us. You know, so you're saying that God's going to deliver Sisera, who is the commander of the Canaanite army, into our hands? Are you sure, Deborah? Are you sure? And I'm, I'm interpreting here what might be going on behind the scenes. But I love what you see here is just a quick glimmer of Deborah's confidence. Because she quickly says, the Lord, the, our God, says we're supposed to go. Now, if you're me... If I were in her shoes, I think that I would be going, okay, Barack, I think God told me, like, I think he might have said we're supposed to take 10,000 men and go into this battle and that he's going to deliver Sisera into our hands. Like, I'm pretty sure he said that, Barack. What do you think? Wouldn't you do that? Like, isn't that how oftentimes when you feel like God has said something to you, you start putting disclaimers on it? You start going, I think God might have said... Because sometimes you even feel a little crazy telling, you know, your friends or your co-workers, your ministry um, co-workers, that I think God's telling us to do this, guys. I think this is the vision he's giving us. At least for me, oftentimes I put so many disclaimers on what I feel like God is telling me. And so I think that is extraordinarily significant in the story because Deborah says, Barak, the Lord our God says, go get 10,000 men. We're going to battle. So you start to see just a glimpse of the confidence she had. And I think that confidence, we'll talk about this in a little bit, has so much to do with her relationship with God. Verse 8, Barak says to her, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. So either one of two things is happening here. We don't know, so I'm totally speculating. But either Barak is thinking, you are absolutely crazy, so I'm going to call your bluff. If you're going to go, let's go. Or he has a tremendous amount of respect and confidence uh, in her that he says let's go together let's do this thing together we don't really know I'm just speculating but you got to put yourself in their shoes sometimes and wonder what in the world uh, you know is going on behind the scenes verse 9 very well Deborah said I'll go with you but because of the way you're going about this the honor will not be yours for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman so Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali 10,000 men followed him and Deborah also went with him so they, they get it all together and they start going. They start recruiting all the guys. Then Deborah says to Brock, verse 14, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? 
And I love this point of the scripture because, again, we don't know how much time elapsed between when Deborah says, okay, God's saying we got to go. Barak, let's get 10,000 men. It's time to go. And then when they've actually gotten 10,000 men to go. Um, there's, you know, again, I wish, I wish more of those dynamics of scripture were written for us. But I, you, so there's some level of time that's elapsed. There's some level of time where Deborah and Barak had to say to 10,000 guys, let's go. God's calling us. We've got to go. And so they, um, so this happens, and I, I would suspect that they met some resistance. I don't know about you, but anytime you try to lead something in our churches, usually you meet just a little bit of resistance somewhere. Um, and so you've got to make an assumption that they probably had some, some big vision casting to do. They probably had to really um, encourage these guys that, guys, God is telling us to go. I know it sounds crazy. I know you don't have weapons, but if God has told us, who can, like we sang a minute ago, who can stand against? And so, you, again, dynamically, I think there's so much happening here. And so then still in verse 14, Deborah says, go. This is the day the Lord is delivering Sisera into our hands. So I love her confidence and her security and her assurance that even, like, I was probably crazy to say that to begin with, right? And then I get 10,000 men to go. And so then you're starting to feel the weight of the responsibility. And as leaders in churches, you know that once you say, hey, let's go do this, or if some of you are young churches or church planters, you've probably had those moments where you've stepped out and you said, okay, we're going, and it's time for the first service, or it's time for, you know, maybe you just relocated or some big change of a, an event for your ministry, and all of a sudden it's like time to go, and you're like, oh my goodness, what have we gotten ourselves into, right? So that's the moment they're at, and Deborah says, go. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into our hands. Let's go. And, uh, uh, the, the beautiful part of that story is that God does deliver uh, the Canaanites, Sisera, into their hands. And God's people experience peace for 40 years because of Deborah and Barak's obedience. 40 years of peace for God's people because they were obedient to what God had put on their, their heart. Because they were obedient and they were confident in the calling God had placed upon them. So for me, I started unpacking this and going, where in the world did she get that kind of confidence? Where in the world was she so confident that God had called her, he'd placed her there for that moment, that he had spoken that very word and that command to her? Where did she find that kind of confidence in who she was and what God had called her to? I'm pretty sure that at the age of four, she wasn't declaring that she wanted to be a prophetess and priest and judge of Israel. I'm pretty sure she probably didn't have her sights set on that. Probably wasn't her dream job to lead the Israelites during a time of oppression when it was probably extraordinarily difficult day in and day out. Can you imagine in the season that the Israelites were oppressed before that victory, the disputes that she settled, probably the lack of hope and um, just the morale of, of God's people in that season. And so day in and day out, and you guys know this as ministry leaders, you know that there are those days when you have to be the positive voice and you have to reassure people that God is with us even when it doesn't feel like God is with us. And so that probably wasn't her dream job. And she probably didn't anticipate asking 10,000 men to go into battle without weapons, potentially to their death, because that's what we do. We go to the side of fear, don't we? When we're afraid of something or we're not sure or not confident in something. And so we go to the side of fear. And so I'm sure she had to think about her level of responsibility as a leader to say, I'm asking 10,000 men to go into battle. They have no weapons. I'm saying that God has called us to this. It doesn't say that God spoke to her audibly, so I'm making an assumption that he didn't, that he, you know, that God spoke to her in how, whatever way he chose to. But that level of confidence and assurance in what God had called her to do and placed her to do, I think is just a remarkable lesson for us as leaders. Um, a couple of quick things I think we can, we can identify in regard to Deborah's confidence. The first one is that I think we can identify consistent character. That again, if Deborah had been a judge of Israel for quite some time and she'd been day in and day out doing the, the things that God had called her to do, that she was settling disputes, that she was taking care of God's people, that even though it was difficult, day in and day out, she was consistently doing the things to, to love and encourage and support God's people. She was doing the little things that mattered. And many days, that's what ministry looks like for, it, for us, doesn't it? Many days, it's the little things that we do behind the scenes that nobody sees, that nobody acknowledges, but they're important to move the ministry forward, and they're important for the moments when you need that influence. And so I think you can make an assumption here that Deborah had consistency of character. Her character and her heart, her integrity were consistent day in and day out, and she had been faithful in the little things 
so that in the moment that it mattered, in the moment she had to make the very big ask and ask people to follow her, that they did. So I think you see a consistency of character um, that, that contributes to her, her level of confidence. I think the second thing you see, and I love this part, um, is consistent humility. And uh, in Judges 5, Judges 5, Judges 4 talks about the battle and, and God giving them the command to, to do that. Judges 5 talks, is their victory song. Deborah and Barak write a victory song. And in Judges 5, Deborah describes herself as a mother in Israel. She doesn't say, I was the prophet, the priest, the judge. She says, I was a mother in Israel. And I love that because I think it's a, just a glimmer of Deborah's humility in her calling that she wasn't all about the titles or being in charge, that she takes on the nurturing, the care, the loving person that I think God had, had created her to be, and she says, that's who I was, that I was a mother in Israel. I wasn't all these other big titles. I was just loving and serving people well. So I think that gives us a glimmer of it. Nancy Beach says about this, she says, it truly is possible to be both humble and confident, because I think we wrestle with this sometimes as leaders, trying to find how to have a godly humility while also being confident in what God's called us to. And Nancy says, it truly is possible to be both humble and confident. God created men and women with gifts and intelligence, and he expects us to steward those gifts boldly, to move forward with our eyes on him, and to lead with the intensity, vision, and enthusiasm he gives. Proverbs 11, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Like, I love that verse. This year, um, I had, instead of doing a, um, uh, what do I want to say, a New Year's resolution or whatever, um, I have a friend who has a blog, and she does a, the one word every year that she wants to live by, and so I thought, well, maybe, that, maybe I should do that, and I just kind of prayed through that and asked God what should be my word, and I wanted my word to be wisdom because I wanted to seek wisdom and grow in that, and I didn't sense God was asking me to use the word wisdom. What I kept, felt like he kept telling me was to use the word humility. I was like, hey, asking for humility is like praying for patience, like you know it's going to be tough, you know? And so, and that journey has been really fascinating over the last just, I guess, four and a half months in the new year so far that I've said, God, I want to pray for humility. I want to have a humble heart. I want to be the person you've called me to be with just a humility and a grace. And, and so you can imagine, like, if you've ever prayed for patience, that God does some things to just wreck your world and remind you of finding our, our, finding our, our hum humility in him. But then I found, found that verse, when pride comes in, comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And so that's been a powerful prayer for me this year, a little sidebar there. The last thing we see from Deborah, I believe, is consistent faith. Her relationship with the, her father is just so beautiful. To know that she hears God's voice and she follows him, even if it seems absolutely crazy. I think it's just remarkable about her character and says something about where her confidence is rooted. is in her consistent faith, her consistent devotion to God, and that above all else, she was sold out for him. And if it meant that she crashed and burned, like if this whole deal, if she felt like God had called her to this moment for this time, and if it didn't work out, she knew that she had to just be obedient to him to death, if that's what it meant. And I think sometimes, you know, I have a tendency of, you know, trying to manage everything else and make sure I'm handling this and taking care of that. And, and okay, God, I think you're telling me to do this, but I'm going to make sure I've covered this base here and this base here and taking care of this and making sure it all kind of works together so I don't really look like a fool. And I think Deborah just kind of goes after it. She just lays it all on the line. And so I love um, the level of confidence, and I think that's come from just a rootedness in her faith and trusting God and just knowing that's what, doing what he's called me to do is the only thing that matters. But on the flip side of that, there's some things that I interpret from Deborah's story that we can't necessarily say are there, but I think if we make the context for our own lives, if I'm honest about the things that hold me up from being confident in who God has called me to be, there's three things that come to mind, and I want to unpack these for you all. We don't know if Deborah wrestled with these, because again, the scripture doesn't give us kind of the backstory. I wish, I wish Deborah had journaled at the time, so we could get like Deborah's side of the story, and to know everything that she was wrestling through, maybe all the doubt, the insecurity, the fear that she wrestled with as she was um, going through this whole dynamic. And again, we don't even know how long, what duration of time took place over that, but I wish we had her journal just to know a little bit more about what was going on with her. But if we put ourselves in her shoes, 
there are three things that I think I would wrestle with, uh, and I know that I wrestle with when it comes to being confident in who God has called me to be in the place he's placed me to serve. The first one is fear. This one breaks my heart because I think particularly as ministry leaders, we allow fear. Um, uh, Jeff was just talking about resistance. I don't know what your discussion about that was yesterday, but I think we allow fear to just uh, hold us back so many times from what God is calling us to do. Because typically God is calling us to things that look absolutely crazy. You know? Yeah. And so that uh, fear is, is, so, is so huge. And every time we make a fear-based decision, I think we lose a bit more influence. You know, the funny thing about fear, um, I lead a team of, of pastors at Crosspoint. And I went through a season of ministry where I was really wrestling with confidence and being placed there and, re- and wrestling with, God, you've placed me here to serve this way and to lead these guys and oh, they're all older than me and they're all, um, uh, they've all got more theolo- theological training and they've all have been pastors longer than I have. I've only been in ministry six years. God, why in the world have you placed me here to lead these guys? And sometimes uh, I allow that fear to just start sabotaging my influence. And, and God kind of showed me at one point, he said, Jenny, you're allowing, your fear-based decisions are noticed. You think you're covering them up. You think you're the only one who knows you're fearful or you're not confident in what I've asked you to do. But they see it. And so every time we make a fear-based decision, we lose a little bit more influence. You don't sense fear in in Deborah's story. At least in the way it's written, you don't sense fear. And so, well, however she handled that, whatever wrestling behind the scenes she and God had to do for her to push through that fear, uh, I think it's important for us as leaders to remember that. 2 Timothy 1.7, I'm sure you can recite this backwards and forwards. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Here's the problem with that verse. We know it so well, we can kind of rattle it off and it no longer is as significant to us. Doesn't that happen sometimes with the scriptures we know so well that they almost lose their impact? And some t- those, that's one of those scriptures that sometimes when you're faced with a fearful moment, it's almost like you have to stop and say it word by word by word and say, God, re- like restore, refresh to me the importance of this verse and the impact of this verse. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Lynn Heibel says, fear magnifies our weaknesses and hides our potentials, or hides our potential. So I would just challenge you guys, as you're processing this, what, what fears are you facing? What are you afraid of? What's holding you back? What dream, what risk, what something new are you not doing that you know God has put on your heart, but fear's holding you back? What is it? And start just praying and wrestling through God of God, help me push through this fear. Help me push past this and find a confidence in that you have called me to this, and so I'm going to go. The second one that I feel like sometimes really sabotages our confidence as uh, as ministry leaders is jealousy. That sometimes uh, we envy so many other things or what other people are doing in their ministry or we're comparing ourselves against everyone else. That jealousy just starts to take root in our heart and it sure sabotages our confidence because instead of confidently doing what we feel like God has called us to do, we're looking at what everyone else is doing and so we're going, well, is that going to work because that church did this? Or this pastor did this, or this, you know, they did this over here, and, you know, so if we do this, I mean, I don't know if that's really going to work. And so sometimes I think we compare so much to what everyone else is doing that we don't necessarily step confidently into what God is calling us to. And so I think, I, I call it jealousy, I think it's, it, it goes hand in hand with comparison, that sometimes we envy what's happening in other people's ministries instead of doing what God's called us to do. So I would just challenge you, what are you jealous of? What are you, what are you coveting that somebody else is doing in ministry instead of just hearing clearly from what God and what God is saying for you and for your ministry area? And the last one is uh, insecurity. Insecurity is defined as a profound sense of self-doubt, a deep feeling of uncertainty about our basic worth and our place in this world. Okay, and guys, don't check out on me on this one because I know girls sometimes tend to tag the insecurity thing as our issue, but I think we all wrestle with this, this description. So maybe if you don't like the word insecurity, throw that out. A profound sense of self-doubt. How often do we find ourselves in that place where we have, we just doubt what we're doing, what we're called to, who we are, 
and don't have a deep sense of our basic worth and our place in this world. Like when you hear, when I heard that definition for the first time, it absolutely broke my heart because I know it was true. That sometimes uh, we have such an uncertainty, to be, uncertainty about our basic worth. I grew up in a pretty fractured home. And so there were, a, I had to deal with a lot of junk and still am of just my sense of belonging, my place, and understanding that my circumstances weren't who I was, that all the things that I did to try to perform and, uh, and earn approval by, by doing good wasn't my worth, that my worth is in my identity in Christ. And again, as leaders, we, we're church ministry folks, and we sometimes are the most guilty of forgetting this, aren't we? Sometimes we're the most guilty of forgetting that we are made in the image of God. We are image bearers of the creator of the universe, and he's called us to help lead and, and, and expand his kingdom. That's what we get to do. And yet sometimes I think the enemy uses these insecurities, these fears, these jealousies to keep us from being confident in that calling, to keep us from being confident in who he has says we are and what he says we're called to do. And so insecurity, I think, is one of the deepest things that just wrecks us as ministry leaders and keeps us from being who we're called to be. Our confidence so much hinges on that sense of belonging, that we belong to Christ, that we belong to him. If I don't feel like I belong, it's impossible for me to feel confident. If I don't understand my place and my worth, it's impossible for me to be confident in what God has called me to do. And so again, as we go back to that story of Deborah, I, I believe she had to have such a confidence in who she was in Christ and what he had called her to do to be able to step out so boldly. And that's my prayer for you guys. That's my prayer for us as ministry leaders, that we would circle back to the foundation of our identity in Christ, who he's called us to be, how he's gifted us, how he's wired us, how he's equipped us to do and be the ministry uh, that we do in our churches. Uh, I've discovered that most of our battles with confidence occur when we're focused on ourselves. Not when insecurity is about, we start focusing on ourselves. Our fears, our jealousies, they become self-fulfilling prophecies that keep us from confidently being ourselves and leading from a place of confidence and security in Christ. So I don't know about you, but I am, I'm a planner, I'm a strategist. I have, to, uh, create, I have to create a plan when I learn something new. And so here is my plan when I first started unpacking this a little bit. Knowing that fear, jealousy, and insecurity are some of the things that keep me from being confident, I had to do a couple of things to help me from, from focusing on myself to focusing on others. The first one of that was to replace fear, when I have those moments of fear and doubt, to replace it with truth. That's when you start quoting those scriptures back and forth. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Replacing it with truth. There's so many truths in scripture about what God says about um, whatever the issue is we're fearing, whatever is holding us back, and going to scripture and finding those truths. And maybe it's someone else who needs to speak truth in your life, but when I'm facing fear, I've got to seek truth. I've got to replace it with truth. When I'm facing jealousy, when I am just dealing with that envy, that comparison, that uh, the biggest thing for me is replacing that with generosity. Because I am comparing myself to someone else and I'm envying their position or the envying that church and what's going on in their life. And the, you know, the quickest way for me to diffuse that and to just kind of break the chains of jealousy or comparison is to replace it with generosity and to lean into that person and to encourage them to, to um, publicly acknowledge and support what they're doing or they or that ministry or you name it, whatever it is, whatever you're comparing yourself with or compare, whom you're comparing yourself to, turning that around and say, you know what, no, I'm going to affirm them. I'm going to affirm what God's doing over here because I see him at work. So I'm going to affirm that. As tough as it is some days, I'm going to affirm that instead of focusing on my own junk. And that is one of the quickest things for me that turns that tide and helps me start seeing the potential um, in the people around me and starts getting the focus off myself. And then the last one, insecurity, replacing insecurity with love. When I become more worried about simply loving others rather than being worried about what they think of me, because isn't insecurity that? Oftentimes I'm thinking about what others are thinking of me and how they're perceiving me and, and all of that. And so when I become more worried about loving others 
insecurity starts taking less of a hold, when I become more worried about other people and loving them and encouraging them and supporting them, then insecurity starts to have less and less of a place in my life. And I think we can interpret that from Deborah's story, that Deborah was lovingly serving God's people day in and day out. And so just the little glimpse that we get, we see her just being consistent to love and to serve and to pour her life into others. And I think that is so significant to how God allowed those chains of, if she dealt with some of the stuff to be broken and for her to be confident in doing everything God had called her to do. So I want to leave you with one verse. This is, this is kind of my life verse, if you will. And I think it kind of summarizes everything we've talked about today. It's Galatians 6, verses 4 and 5. And I take it from the message, but whatever verse, or version you, you prefer, it says, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given. Who you are and the work you've been given. Who you are is a child of God, a son, a daughter of the King. Who you are is all about your identity in him and being an image bearer of, of Jesus Christ. That's who you are. And then the work you've been given. Where have you been placed to serve? What's your role? What's your responsibility? Whatever that looks like, God has placed you uniquely there. That's your calling. That's where he's called you to serve for this moment. Sometimes I think we place so much emphasis on calling and we idolize some positions over others. And I think that, that grieves my heart because I think there's so much about wherever God has placed us and the circle of influence you have and the people who are watching you, the people who are looking to you to invest in them. And every one of you have a circle of people, could be volunteers, could be other ministry staff, that you support and you encourage and you pour your lives into. It could be the attenders of your church. And by serving them, by loving them faithfully in whatever role you play, that is God, what God's call for you is right now. So make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given. And then sink yourself into it. I love that part of the verse. Sink yourself into it. Pour your life into it. Pour your life into the work and the calling and the place that God has placed you right now. I love this. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your life. I love that verse. I keep it plastered in front of me. I've had it memorized for years because when I face those enemies of confidence, the fear, the insecurity, the comparison stuff, I have to go back to that to say, God, who have you called and created me to be? And how can I do that? How can I live? How can I do the creative best I can with the life you've given me? So as ministry leaders, I hope that 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 just encourages you, that reminds you that God has placed you where you are for a very significant purpose and reason. That he has called you, he's equipped you to do exactly what you're doing in the place that you're doing it. And I hope that you'll just boldly, confidently step into that knowing that God is with you. Can I pray for you all? Yeah. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this group of people who love you and are serving you. Some days it's just hard. It's just difficult. Some days we want to walk away. Some days we, f we face the fears, the doubts, the insecurities, the comparisons, all the ugly stuff that is just so difficult to push past. And so God, I just pray that wherever these folks are, whatever their challenge is, whatever is holding them back from being confident in who you've created them to be, God, I just pray that you would just speak to them that you would remind them of the truth of, their, of your scriptures, God, about who you say they are, what you've called them to, how you've gifted them, how beautiful they are to you, God. I pray that you would just remind them of that, that this time away, a couple of days to just be refreshed and encouraged and to be re-energized about ministry, God, I just pray that it would just be such a special moment for these guys and that you would just bless their time spent. Bless them for the work that they do in the ministry, God, because I know some days it's just hard. But God, we're grateful. We're grateful that you call us. We're grateful that you, you have equipped us even in our frailty and our humanity. God, you are still God. And if you are for us, who can be against us? So God, thank you. I thank you for this place. I thank you for Preston Wood and hosting us. Thank you for Fellowship Technologies and Dynamic Church for just creating a great opportunity for us to learn and grow and be encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.